Hello everyone, a warm welcome from my side. Uh, my name is Elke Kirchmeier and I have the pleasure to co-chair this evening session today with uh, Josh Farley. Uh, we've arrived at the end of the first conference day on a panel on the future of ecological economics. And the idea of this panel is to provide a space to critically reflect on what is happening in our field, what has happened in, the, in our field. Uh, to embark on construct more constructive and possibly more constructive perspectives and perspectives. The background idea of this session is that, I think we all know that ecological economics has emerged and developed as a field to deal uh, with ecological and social crisis and do so in a way that um, transcends some of the problems we have in economics. And while we recognize that we've achieved some things, uh, there are ecological economic programs now, there's a substantial body of literature, we have a relatively good journal, um, and some influence on policy, there's also a stark reality that uh, the social and ecological problems we try to um, mitigate have all grown worse, and we have we have, in fact, uh, failed to have any significant impact on, on the dominant economic ideology as well. So against this background, we want to offer this panel as a space for reflection and to discuss what we can do as a community to have greater impact on the future. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers. We have six panelists um, uh, spanning some of the founding members of our field, uh, uh, together with young scholars. Uh, in alphabetical order, I would like to briefly mention our panelists, uh, Bengi Ankvulos, Luiso Kainsburo, uh, Bob Costanza, Corina Wengler, Lise Kral, and Beatrice Sai. Welcome, and thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, the structure of this session uh, is that we invite, I will invite every panelist to provide a brief five minute statement on their view of the future of ecological economics. Um, <clears throat> during that time, please feel free everyone to post your questions in the chat. Uh, but we would also like to invite you to use the chat mindfully. Uh, from, we have we have a lesson that already from the morning session that uh, there are many people participating and many comments uh, arriving in the chat and it will make Josh life much easier to feel to go through all your comments and questions uh, if you really focus on um, questions you have to the panelists and uh, please abstain from writing things like great I agree with your point or, or any of, any of those um if uh if possible um we will follow we will have a sufficient time for posing your questions and engaging in discussion with the panelists and round up uh, the panel with closing statements and i would like to leave the introduction very brief from my side and without further ado pass over to our first panelist um Bengi Akpulot, and please, before you provide your statement, uh, would you like to introduce yourself in just a sentence or two to the audience? And uh, the floor is yours. Um, hi, I'm Bengi Akpulot. I'm an assistant professor at the, at the Department of Geography, Planning and Environment at Concordia University, Montreal. Uh, and I'm really excited and honored to be a part of this panel. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to jump right in um, about where I see the future of ecological economics. Where I see the future of ecological economics is actually a deeper and a closer engagement with alternatives to the contemporary economic systems that we live in. Uh, a deeper and closer engagement with alternative economic models and futures that would inform a non-capitalist economy. 
Um, ecological economics actually offers a vision about how to organize economic decision making uh, for sustainability. It actually makes a strong case for economic democracy and a strong critique of atomistic decision making, whether it's in the, within the context of markets or within the context of the firm. And that needs to be a lot more at the forefront today. And I say today not only because of the seriousness um, of the intertwined crisis that we're living in today, but for two particular reasons that are related to these crises. So first of all, a lot of the discussions today, debates around sustainability and transition revolve around how to reorient economic activities towards more sustainable ones. For instance, how to move away from fossil fuels. And I don't want to get into different visions of how to do it, uh, but just kind of an observation that a lot of the discussion is about kind of changing, shifting the weight of the economic activity. Uh, but there is very little, almost none, discussion about how economic processes are to be governed, how economic decisions at various fields and scales to be made, and what kind of economic institutions are needed for the governance of economic activity. Um, and I will, in a minute, briefly sketch out the, why I think ecological economics has a lot to offer in that regard rooted in its particular view of the economy. But the second reason I want to highlight is that there's already a lot happening in terms of economic alternatives to capitalism, both in scholarly academically debate, but also in terms of concrete practices on the ground. But this has remained mostly outside of the radar of ecological economics. There's already a rich and long tradition of thinking, of theorizing alternatives to capitalism, both in economics, but also in other social sciences. But there is, especially today, a flourishing debate um, on economic alternatives, especially in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, which opened up um, a space for both experimentation and thinking. And I think ecological economics has actually a lot to offer in this regard, especially in terms of its biophysical approach to the economy and the links it establishes that actually draws between processes of governing decision-making, processes of governing economic decisions and our ability to uh, ensure just sustainability. So I'm going to just briefly sketch out, kind of draw out some of the main kind of tenets or, or ideas developed within ecological economics that I think um, makes a strong critique for atomistic decision-making and also actually makes a strong case for democratizing decision-making in the economy. First of all, ecolo for ecological economists, complexity, uncertainty, and ignorance are fundamental features that mark the biosphere and our relationship with the biosphere. Um, so we don't know the future of the ecosystems and it follows that market prices and the market process cannot capture, cannot reflect all that is at stake with uh, associated with a decision. Secondly, for ecological economists, again, environments, the environment is marked by social and physical interdependencies. Um, kind of simply put, what I choose to do with the environment has a direct implication on what others can do with the environment. And building on this again, um, it implies that atomistic decision making, whether in the market context or in the firm, cannot actually um, account, take these interdependencies in the, in, into account when it's an atomistic kind of uh, context of decision making. Thirdly, ecological economists espouse value incommensurability, and they hold that it is not possible to reduce all values associated with the environment into a single denominator. And instead, they call for a comparison of alternatives based on multiple dimensions, rather than relying on single denominators like monetary um, prices to guide decisions. And fourthly, for ecological economists, um, values are not given, but they are articulated, which means that a collective deliberative process of decision making would reveal and articulate different values than an isolated one, which would encourage utilitarian values and an individualistic uh, mentality. So these four, uh, four pillars actually together make a strong case for making economic decisions through a democratic collective process of deliberation where uncertain risks and interdependencies can be weighed from multiple and incommensurable perspectives of those uh, who would be affected. And I'm going to wrap it up here and I'm looking forward to discussing further. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Bengi, for kicking us off here. And I would directly like to pass on the word to Louison. Thank you very much, uh, Elke. So my name is Louison Kainfuro. I am a postdoc researcher at the Institute for Ecological Economics in Vienna where I work uh, in the field of ecological macroeconomics and the political economy of capitalism and the environment. So uh, thank you very much to Elke and Joshua for putting this panel together. I'm super happy to, to be here to discuss with, uh, with all of you. So given, given my own research uh, and to be also, I think, complementary to the other panelists, I would like to focus first on macroeconomic aspects because for, for a long time, ecological economics was lacking a proper macroeconomics but this is changing thanks to the emergence of ecological macroeconomics since about the early 2010s. And to my opinion, this is a very welcome uh, development in ecological uh, economics. And in particular, uh, I hope that it will pave the way to remedy what I call the historical theoretical incompleteness of ecological economics, because the field has developed over the years a very thorough and uh, relevant critique of growth, but very paradoxically, it has never developed an analysis or an understanding of the socio-economic system into which growth happens, namely capitalism. And I think it's about time for ecological economics to develop a proper macroeconomics of capitalism, to understand it as a system, and to understand what makes the ecological unsustainability of this particular system. And moreover, I think that the rise of an ecological macroeconomics and of a proper ecological economics analysis of capitalism would also pave the way for more reflexivity on some concepts that are commonly used in ecological economics, for instance, the concept of natural capital. Um, and in light of what I just said, uh, to my opinion, ecological economics really need to integrate together the, the analysis of socioeconomic dynamics uh, and the analysis of environmental dynamics. Uh, and this is a way to really make concrete uh, in research the pre-analytic vision of the economy as embedded in society and of society as embedded in the environment. And for instance, we need to understand the role of the environment and of natural resources in the emergence of the socioeconomic and political compromises that are embedded in the institutions that regulate and stabilize our societies through normalizing social conflicts and antinomic interests. And to do so, we need to also engage more with other political economy approaches both to borrow from them and also to bring insight of ecological economics to them. Also, moreover, understanding the role of uh, the environment and of natural resources in social, economic, and political compromises is necessary to be policy relevant, I think. And when engaging with policy making, ecological economics should be concerned about not talking only to institutions. And it is very important that we reflect on our own role and place as experts, because there is a need to translate ecological economics ideas and proposals into concrete strategies. And here, if I can uh, make briefly some advertisement, there is a book in the making that uh, is edited by Degros Vienna, which is called De uh, Strategies for Degros, which will tackle precisely uh, this issue. And you can find out more and also support the crowdfunding campaign for it at uh, degrosvienna2020.org. Um, so ecological economics as a field, I think, should now seek to become mainstream in other areas of economics. And there are three ways of doing it, uh, spreading in economics, spreading in minds, and spreading in departments. So spreading in economics means that ecological economists, we should venture beyond the historical frontiers of ecological economics in fields that most of the time do not explicitly relate to ecological issues, but where insights from ecological economists would be useful. For instance, the study of business cycles, the study of financial crisis, money, international monetary flows and finance, innovation, or the role of technological innovation and of social innovation, <coughs> sorry, 
also inter intersectionality issues, of course, income and wealth inequality or the analysis of the firm. And it should become normal to see ecological economists publishing regularly in other journals than ecological economics, as much as I love this journal. To spread in minds, of course, it's necessary because no field can flourish without transmission and young generation taking over. And I think there is a dire need for pedagogical material because there are already some textbooks of ecological economics available. But what we need is to go beyond that. We need textbooks not of ecological economics per se, but of the ecological approach to economics. And that is, we need, to, we need textbooks of economics through ecological lenses. And hence, the need to invest also topics and subfields that have historically been quite far from the preoccupation of ecological economics. But to do this, we need people. And I will conclude on that because ecological economics need to spread in departments. And the only way to secure the field is to offer tenure positions for young scholars. And I think like to more senior and tenured people that are listening today, please push the doors and go on strike to get more tenure positions for younger precarious people. That would help the field. Thanks you very much. Thank you very much, Louis, for your intervention, uh, for your very passionate intervention. And this uh, bridges nicely, I think, to our next speaker, uh, Bob Costanza. Uh, the floor is yours, please. Hello, everyone. Great to be here. I guess I'm, <clears throat> um, well, I'm a uh, ecological economic economist from way back. I'm probably the, uh, the, the oldest one here. <laughs> uh, I'm the founding um, <clears throat> president of the International Society for Ecological Economics and the founding editor of the, the journal. So um, <clears throat> I've seen the, the uh, evolution of this transdisciplinary field, uh, you know, over the, the last 30 years, really, it's been when it's been in existence as a, as a formal thing. Uh, and, and I think it's important to continue to think of it as a transdiscipline, not as a, as a specific field or, or as a, as a subdiscipline, certainly not. Um, and um, that, that was the idea from the very beginning. Um, you know, how do we bring together in a whole systems approach? My background is in, is in systems ecology. Um, and um, the idea there is, again, to think of, you know, the economy as embedded within the society, embedded within uh, the rest of nature, and recognizing that, you know, humans are part of this larger uh, uh, system. And I think that's what we uh, are trying to understand is that whole interconnected uh, complex, uh, complex system. Um, <clears throat> And I think that's certainly difficult, especially in the uh, academic environment that we all find ourselves in, that is focused on academic disciplines and is focused on <clears throat> what's been called the argument culture. You know, how do, we, how do we set all of these issues up as debates uh, rather than as discussions that are focused on finding solutions and creating a real synthesis of all of the information that we know. So, so I think ecological economics needs to, to remain focused on this idea of synthesis and, and solutions um, and around a, um, a systems, a, a whole systems approach. Um, you know, supporting that within uh, the academic environment uh, is, is cont continues to be difficult, uh, but I think it is evolving um, in, a, in a way that, that makes it uh, easier than it, that it was in the past. Certainly, and I certainly see a lot, a lot of, uh, of movement in that direction. Um, it was mentioned earlier that there are a lot of other um, ideas, uh, you know, that are uh, sort of supportive of, of, the, of the same sorts of things that we're talking about. And I think it's also important to build broader alliances among all of these ideas. You know, the idea of, of donut economics or the you know, circular bioeconomics and uh, all of the, the things that have been mentioned today. Um, I think the, the, uh, the, the challenge is really to integrate across all of those ideas and to really produce true synthesis uh, focused on solutions and focused on um, designing um, a better future. I think we need to think of ecological economics not as purely uh, analysis, that's certainly part of it, uh, but <clears throat> the synthesis and the design and the creation of, better, uh, of a better world uh, is, is really what, uh, what we should focus on. 
you know, if I could quote from uh, Buckminster Fuller, you know, he said, you, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And I think that's what we've been trying to do over the last, over the last 30 years. Uh, with, <clears throat> with, I think, some success, because I think the conversation over that time has, has changed significantly. You know, issues of equity and issues of, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, protecting the environment, uh, issues of how do we design a sustainable well-being future, I think, have, have, uh, have come much more to the, uh, to the fore than they had been in, uh, uh, <clears throat> when we started uh, ecological economics back, back in, the late, in the late 1980s. Uh, and it has always been a, a pluralist approach. Um, you know, the, one of our, uh, I think, operating principles uh, that we need to keep in mind is that all models are wrong. Uh, any way of looking at the world is a, is a simplification that's, that's at least incomplete. Uh, so <clears throat> we're, never, we're never going to come to the truth, the absolute truth about any of these issues. And it's important to recognize and be humble about uh, the, the kinds of uh, approaches that we're, that we're taking. Um, but some models are useful <laughs> and some models are more useful than others. And I think part of the problem is recognizing that the conventional economic approach uh, and that model, which, which has been, had been useful at certain periods and for certain things uh, is not useful for the, the problems that we're facing today. Uh, of climate change, of creating this, this sustainable and desirable future. Uh, so I think I'm coming to the end here. Let me just mention a few other things. I think we are at a critical decade uh, and, uh, and we need to develop new institutions as well to go forward. You know, things like common asset trust uh, to manage, uh, to manage our, our community assets. I think there's a whole range of design design issues that, that we, we really need to, to focus on going forward. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, our next speaker is uh, Corinna Denga. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks so much for the invitation and your kind introduction. My name is Corina, Corina Dengler. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a feminist ecological economist. I did my um, PhD on um, what degrowth learns from the feminist critique of science, economics, and growth. And I'm currently employed as um, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Kassel. Um, and what I thought was really interesting about this panel is that we're agreeing somehow that ecological economics was founded in the 1970s as a response really to this emerging ecological and social crises. And what we actually see today is that over the last couple of years, ecological crises um, have gotten much worse since. So we're living nowadays through multiple and really overlapping crises. Climate change is one of them, but we also have crises of inequality, of care, of militarization, just to name a few. So most of those crises are further exacerbated with the COVID-19 pandemic. We can see this very well with the crises of care and social reproduction, where we can really see how the wealth and well-being of the world rests upon paid and unpaid care work, a sphere that is highly gendered and which is um, socially devalued in a capitalist growth paradigm. So I think one thing we can see if, when we're actually focusing on ecological crises is that we have those contradictions within capitalism and they're interconnected also with other relations of dominations, like for example, patriarchy, coloniality and racism. And I think as ecological economists, we should be aware that if we want to really see transformative solutions to this interlinked crisis system, we need to move away from an economic system that is structurally based on extractive capitalism, on white supremacy, on coloniality, and also on patriarchy. So if I, I'm thinking about the implications of this for the future of ecological economics, um, I think there are two points I see. So the first point I see is that I think that as ecological economists, we really need to recollect the radical ecological growth critique from the 1970s. 
Um, so Eric Gomez Bagatun and Jose Naredo had this paper in 2015 where they said that in the 1970s there was really this narrative of its, eco uh, its um, economic growth versus an ecological sustainability. And that discourse changed to say, okay, growth and sustainability are somehow compatible in the Brundtland report, or we can even have growth for sustainability if it's only green growth. So, and then obviously with the degrowth movement, we had kind of a second wave of radical ecological growth critique going back to this narrative of growth versus sustainability. And I think that as ecological economists, we really should embrace this growth versus sustainability narrative, which nowadays I would argue also means embracing degrowth scholarship and activism. So I think that this conference, which is like kind of this mixed conference, ecological economics and degrowth is really an important step um, into this direction. Um, so secondly, and more um, linked to my analysis of the multidimensional crisis I made before, I think that ecological economists really need to broaden their horizon to not only include like radical ecological growth critique into their models, but really also, for example, feminist growth critique, North-South critique, socioeconomic growth critique, cultural critique of growth. So I, I myself, I'm focusing on um, so convergence between um, feminist economics and ecological economics. And I think that ecological economists should be more aware about the structural similarity of how nature and women are in a way discursively and materially um, devalued in our current economic system. We should discuss, for example, the patriarchal roots of the growth paradigm, should be aware that gender relations are really omnipresent and that more often than not putatively gender neutral policies have highly gendered outcomes. And we should embrace as ecological economists like the often neglected feminist roots of critical environmental thinking that has also been there like since the 1960s, 1970s and reflect on why the scholarship is often structurally forgotten when we're talking about founding fathers of ecological economics and degrowth. So I think we don't have to reinvent the wheel but really just try to broaden our alliances in order to really um, seek those transformative solutions that we need for this interlinked crisis system. Five minutes are over already. I'm stopping there and hope um, to have more discussion afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marina, for an excellent input and taking care of time as well. Um, uh, I'd like to pass on to Lisi Kreil. You're muted, Lissy. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you uh, uh, for extending the invitation for me to talk today. Um, I'm going to share uh, something that comes out of my own research and my own inclinations and experience with uh, ecological economics. Um, I'm going to start by saying that I think ecological economics needs to refocus uh, on a better understanding of economic systems, how they're organized, and how they define the relationship between humans and the more than human world. Economic systems provide the context uh, that determines the human relationship to Earth. Um, and the project uh, should include, but not be, not be limited to a better understanding of global capitalism. Let me elaborate for a minute. Um, there is a very real duality that exists now uh, uh, between humans and earth that is embodied in our economic system, where the economic system functions as if it is uh, not connected to the earth, at the same time it is intimately connected to the earth. Uh, clearly for the vast majority of human history, uh, this hasn't been the case. Humans lived in an economic life and around an economic order that was more or less embedded in the rhythm and dynamic of the more than human world. Uh, we need to understand more about the profound alteration in human economic life that has occurred over our history. We need to know more about how we arrived here. Uh, historically, ecological economics has been really good at generating an awareness that there is a connection between economy and earth. Hence the 
uh, concepts like natural capital, uh, ecosystem services, uh, the second law of thermo thermodynamics. But we need to understand more clearly the presence of duality, the very real sense in which the economic system functions as if, as if it's disconnected from the earth. It needs, ecological econom economics needs to move away from making people aware that it's connected to understanding the duality and the disconnection that exists. In this spirit, I would say that ecological economics should usher in a new era of inquiry, a transdisciplinary project that reaches into the depth of human social evolution to explain this profound alteration of the human economic system from Earth. I would jettison some of the valuation studies for more of this type of inquiry. This is a complicated and transdisciplinary disciplinary project, but out of it, I believe we can find more depth of field uh, in our focus and more awareness of the levers of change, um, uh, of effective change. Um, Elke and Josh posed some uh, uh, questions we might respond to, and one of them was, what does ecological economics offer for a socially just transition? Um, I'd like to just kind of ask this of this question. A socially transition, a socially just transition to what? I think ecological economics can frame things more effectively. What are we transitioning to? Do uh, to a world where half of the Earth's surface is reserved for other species, as E.O. Wilson has suggested? We need to be clear about what we want to transition to, and then we can figure out what a socially just transition would look like. With all the justifiable concentration on inequality, we can't lose sight of the needs to connect a socially just transition to planetary limits, and not just to planetary limits, but to real rapprochement with Earth, where other species have the right to their own self-willed lives. Um, EE has helped to frame this conversation, but it has also hedged this conversation by resorting to vague concepts like development without growth. In the context of global capitalism, the sixth mass extinction, a human population of 8 billion people, development without growth is a vagueness that isn't all that productive. Let me just say too that I think ecological economics needs to continue to move in the direction of heterodoxy. And I'm not gonna say much more about that because there's a lot of heterodox people uh, on this panel that can speak to that. But I think there's a whole history behind why it didn't start there. Uh, we could talk about that, but I'm not going to. I just think that that understanding um, in, more, in a more critical way, the origins of inequality and the duality between humans and earth is an important uh, thing to understand. Um, and let me finish by saying this, ecological economics has to be the voice of, a, of greater clarity about the power we have or don't have to alter our trajectory. Um, it should be clear by now uh, that we are not entirely in charge of the economic trajectory despite our intentionalities. Uh, my interpretation, it may be wrong, but my interpretation of Herman Daly is that Herman Daly understood something we should all understand. He understood that it is highly unlikely that we would fundamentally alter the economic system. Daly's response was to develop a steady a framework for a steady state economy uh, to try to provide guidance for a system not inclined in the direction he knew we needed to go. Um, let's leave all of the problems with his framework aside. I don't want to concentrate on that and just concentrate on his impulse and ask a simple question. Can we fundamentally alter this system? What are our levers of change? It is my sense that ecological economics needs to be clearer about how powerful global capitalism is and how difficult it is to alter its structure and dynamic and the duality it extends between humans and earth. Um, it needs to be more probing in understanding how the system changes over time. A materialist approach to understanding our historical moment would posit that contradictions in the system develop in it. 
and finally give rise to a solution or to a different system. Um, and the contradictions we know are not as simple as a contradiction between labor and capital. The profound contradiction we confront right now is a contradiction between the need for jobs and um, economic security and planetary limits. I'm finishing, Josh. Um, what if the resolution to this contradiction is the conclusion of the sixth mass extinction? So I think we need to think a little bit about how systems change. Thanks. Uh, many thanks, DC. I look forward to, uh, to extending this discussion afterwards. Uh, but before that, uh, I'd like to ask Beatrice Sai for our last uh, before we open up so, uh, for broader discussion and debate. Hi, I'm Beatrice Sais. I'm professor of economic development and ecological economics at the Federal University of Sao Paulo. Uh, thank you all, uh, for the opportunity to reflect with you on the future of ecological economics. Uh, I try to make a small contribution to this debate, explaining my view about eco ecological economics, but uh, focusing on what I think that's central from a global South perspective or mainly a Latin American perspective. Uh, I take this perspective because uh, through my trajectory as a student and researcher, I found in ecological economics ways to understand and think about economics that help me to understand the problems of Brazil. And um, by taking this Latin American perspective, I'd like to emphasize mainly two different but uh, related aspects of ecological economics. First, the potential of ecological economics to reflect about Latin American problems, but also second, the influence that ecological economics has received and receives from Latin American ideas. In my opinion, these aspects are strengths that result from an interdisciplinary, plural and critical approach, and that can help to think about global South struggles and hopefully also about social just transitions. So, in Latin America until today, there has never been a set of economic theories and perspectives that could answer the most basic needs of its populations. In the 19th century, while liberal policies benefited industrializing European countries, the firm Spanish and Portuguese colonies were condemned to sell raw materials over exploiting both their labor and nature. When the global North experienced the relative social and economic stability of the introduction of Keynesian policies, countries in Latin America began to industrialize but without reducing social inequality. In the 70s and 80s, when the liberalization of capital flows generated against for the global north, Latin America accumulated external debts and start to pay its grown debt by again selling its natural resources. More recently, the acceleration of global capitalism and the industrialization of Asian countries reinforced its pattern. And despite some years of economic growth, the final result was mainly the increase of environmental injustices, economic crisis, and also the instability of our democracies. However, in the face of these difficulties, many Latin American economists, thinkers, and activists developed autonomous theories and creative ideas that responded to, this region, to the region's particular problems. The Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean at CLAC, led by the Argentine economist Raul Plebs, made the most important criticism of Latin American specialization in the export of agriculture and mineral resources. After, social movements criticizing the sale of natural resources to pay off Latin America's external financial debt claim instead the payment of the ecological debt by the global north accumulated over centuries of colonization and exploitation in the region. More recently, new Latin American perspectives have also started to propose alternatives to development, such as the Ben Bibid and the post-structivism. And of course, it's also very important the environmentalism of the poor in Latin America as shown by Joao Martinez Ali. In economic theory, in general, and especially in recent decades, Latin American perspectives have been marginalized. I believe that ecological economics is an approach that has the potential to incorporate an 
dialogue with the most creative part of Latin American thinking. Many of these ideas are a red part of ecological economics and are, are even strong when articulated, articulated with ecological economics analysis. For instance, social metabolism analysis and understanding the dynamics of material and energy flaws may reinforce the arguments around ecological debt or criticisms around the effects of free trade for the periphery. Ecological economic is not tied to merely analytical concerns like neoclassical economics, because it has an approach driven by real social and environmental concerns. So it has great capacity to understand and re review historical problems in the global south, south and in Latin America, which have been overlooked by mainstream economics. At the same time, I believe that in the current context of economic, social, political, and environmental crisis in Latin America and everywhere, ecological economics can also go beyond heterodox approach by dialoguing with the more creative and solidarity ideas developed here. That's why I hope that by being open to the global South ideas and struggles, ecological economics can help us to think about socially just transitions. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Beatrice. Um, we have plenty of time now for a first, I would suggest the first round of questions and responses. Yeah, so um, I've been trying to go through the questions and distill some of the good ones. And there's, um, and I'll start with some that are kind of to everybody. Um, and there's quite a few others that are specific. But does anybody have any reflections on what's the position of ecological economics on the idea of sustainable development offered by the UN? So the sustainable development goals and any um, feedback on how that relates to EE. Bob? I think the, <clears throat> the SDGs are a real milestone in the history of, of humanity where there, there is a evolving shared vision, you know, among at least all the, uh, the governments of the world. And I think that's, <clears throat> that's really what's essential uh, to, to move beyond, uh, you know, the, the, the current system is to create an alternative vision, a vision that's, that's built around, you know, um, <clears throat> around sustainable well-being. Um, I think there's some holes in the, in the goals. Uh, number eight is still about economic growth, uh, <clears throat> but, you know, modified a bit. Uh, but I think in general, by putting all of the other elements, at least on the table, you know, of, of equity, of protecting the environment, of, of uh, <clears throat> you know, of eliminating hunger and et cetera, you know, education. So <clears throat> getting all of those things on the table, I think, is a, is a significant step forward. And I think if we are going to change, change things, I think a first step in the, in the therapy uh, to help us overcome this addiction to the, to the growth at all costs model is really building this shared vision of where, where we want to go. What does the system uh, really look like? And I, I think it's, it's certainly not, um, it's not there yet, but I think the SDGs are, are a major step in, uh, in that direction. Anyone else have a comment, something to add to that? Bengi? Um, I'm going to say something slightly different than Bob, and I, I also want to say that it is hard to speak on behalf of ecological economics as if it is a homogeneous field, so I think it is only normal that we disagree on things like this. Um, I am actually a lot more skeptical and critical of the sustainable development goals than, than Bob is, and, and I think uh, I think they can be used strategically as tools to push for meaningful change and, and kind of not fall into some of the traps uh, that Bob has identified. Uh, but I think there is an equal danger of them being used to restore business as usual. And I think what we see is more that today. And if I think there are also other visions and other demands coming from social movements like Beatrice has, has very well described that kind of vision coming from Latin American movements that, and, and Corina talked about degrowth. So there are already other proposals out there that ecological economics can make uh, more commonsensical in addition to sustainable development goals. Any other panelists have a comment they'd like to make on? Oh. Um, 
Right. And I should also say that I think you should feel free to, um, you know, we're reading uh, comments from the audience, but if you would like to respond as well to what other panelists have said, you know, feel free to raise your hand to do that. And, um, uh, you know, to, um, yeah, basically to have a dialogue. So another, um, a lot of questions are just uh, individuals, although they're open for, um, you know, others to respond. One I thought was interesting, and I'm going to actually briefly comment on this is, the question is, have any of the panel experienced pushback from their university or colleagues when they changed to ecological economics? And very quickly, I would just like to say that when I did my PhD kind of at the height of liberal, neoliberal ideology, my committee told me that if I persisted in trying to do my dissertation in ecological economics, I would never get a job and I would never get a publication and I was just wasting my time. And even more recently at my university here, the environmental economist, it was obviously tongue in cheek, but my students told me that the environmental economist offered extra credit to anybody who would beat up my TAs because he was sick of their questions challenging the mainstream view. And uh, students have repeatedly tried to get my courses cross-listed in the mainstream economics department to no avail. So th those were just my experiences, but now I would like to turn that over to the um, panelists if any of them had had any of these uh, similar type uh, problems when they switched to ecological economics. Please. I guess I could uh, link that to my uh, intervention because I was saying that uh, in Latin America, uh, we are open. I mean, we had to be open to different and alternative perspectives because uh, both the orthodox and heterodox approach didn't work really well here in the last century. So I think here the universities, uh, at least the economic departments that I know better, they are much more open to heterodox approaches than in North, uh, North America and, and I think that in central, you know, central countries. So we have uh, even in the best universities a lot of Marxist and Keynesian uh, professor. Uh, it's true that we don't have a lot of ecological economics. So ecological economics is still trying to you know, open space I think in the university here, but uh, I think that, uh, yeah, this diverse here, it's good actually for ecological economics and maybe it's possible that we can have uh, more space in, in this department of economics. And I didn't see whose hand went at first, either Luison or Corina. Um, you know, just, and my screen, you're first Luison, so sorry for uh, the yeah, no, I just wanted to mention that uh, personally, I was never uh, discouraged from engaging with ecological economics because I was lucky enough to do my PhD uh, in a heterodox department uh, in France. But I remember that when I uh, signed up for my master's degree there, the head of the master, who was himself, uh, who is himself a heterodox economist, told me very honestly, uh, I'm very happy that you want to do heterodox economics, but you should know that uh, the game will be harder for you. So sometimes the uh, heterodox economics, economics themselves, they want their students because they know that it's not going to be uh, as easy as for a mainstream economist out there. And it's not easy for a young mainstream economist either, uh, by the way. But um, I'll, I'll get, I can just give another example uh, here at the Institute at the University of Economics and Business in Vienna. We have an Institute for Ecological Economics, but we are not part of the Department of Economics. We are part of the Department of Social Economics. And uh, the relation uh, with the Department of Economics uh, are uh, more or less good. Uh, and recently, uh, the discussion uh, went on uh, the pages of Der Standard, which is the main uh, Austrian uh, newspaper, because uh, there was kind of an attack by a member of the Department of Economics on, uh, on work related to degrowth, but on empirical work, on material flows, and so on. So we responded by uh, an op-ed as well in the, in, in, the, in the newspaper like that. So it's, uh, it's as much as a power battle between, uh, within university and also a battle of ideas. Nina, do you have? Oh. Yeah, thank you. I think it's a very interesting question. My contribution actually links a lot to what Louis Saw says because um, I also studied social ecological economics in Vienna and I also studied a mainstream economics bachelor's in Vienna and was really happy to study a master at the Institute for Ecological Economics, but then at the same time realized that at the um, 
mainstream economics department, like the mainstream is reproduced even more. And just very recently, like the heterodox economics institute got cut. So I always wonder myself, like so in between, we want a safe space to teach, not only to counteract the mainstream, but to actually teach ecological economics to merge with feminist economics. But on the other hand, how do we actually um, how do we actually push back mainstream economics from mainstream economics departments if we all move to our single spaces? So that's something I think we also need to talk about as ecological economists. So no further comments. I can move on to the next question. And a lot of the questions here are, as I say, directed to individuals. Um, but one that was uh, for Bengi. Um, says that ecological economics should support economic democracy, should analyze and critique processes of capital concentration, which go counter to economic democracy. Is that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that goes without saying. I mean, there. I think there are many uh, ways in which um, this kind of engagement could uh, take place, could operate, could be operationalized in terms of of research or, or analysis. Uh, one way is concentration and, and centralization of capital, obviously, um, and kind of forms of actually decision-making um, that are happening today in advanced capitalism that fall outside of the textbook economics textbooks as well. Uh, it's not a kind of perfectly competitive market we're talking about. It's not a kind of a representative firm or representative individual we're talking about in terms of how power is articulated in, uh, in capitalism. So I think a broader kind of agenda could be uh, kind of a political ecological economics of advanced capitalism but an economic democracy agenda, uh, both as a research agenda, but as a kind of an agenda to push for, for ecological economics would obviously focus on, on that too. Anybody else have any? Um, all right, so um, thanks, Mengi. Um, and then here's one that probably will get a bit of a, uh, feedback. So it was directed to Bob, but I think other people will have things to say. And it's, what do you think about ecosystem services valuation now in light of criticism that is feeding into capitalist economic structures? I don't think it is <laughs> feeding into capitalist economic structures. I think it is raising awareness about the connections between humans and, uh, and the rest of nature. I think it gets misinterpreted um, <clears throat> by, by some people. Uh, and I think that misinterpretation often has to do with thinking that, um, you know, stating some of these values in monetary units is the same thing as recommending that they be privatized uh, and et cetera. So it's more, it's more about how to manage those systems than it is how to, how to, uh, how to understand their connection to, uh, to human well-being. And so <clears throat> I think that's, and that's a whole separate issue that we could, we could talk about. Uh, the whole issue of how do we manage the commons, you know, and the fact that ecosystem services are largely uh, <clears throat> public goods uh, that sh that are outside the market and should stay outside the market, but need to be managed in a way that recognizes their contribution to human well-being uh, and <clears throat> and and, uh, and can support that. So this idea of common asset trust that I mentioned before, I think is one one approach that we might we might take in managing those systems. And you know, if the state of Vermont has proposed. Uh, incorporating that into legislation. I'm working now with uh, Costa Rica where they're, they're sort of evolving their payment for ecosystem services um, system into something more like a national common asset trust, recognizing that these ecosystems are really things that we need to <clears throat> manage as a, as a community, as a, as a common asset, rather than uh, just a, a, a place for extraction of, of, uh, of resources. So I think that, <clears throat> yeah. I don't know if that answers the question, but uh, I think if it uh, it's 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 uh, partly a misinterpretation rather than than, uh, than a problem. Anyone else have comments on that? Um, perhaps in the light of uh, you know the recent Dasgupta report on economics of biodiversity, um, which when I looked at you know I thought oh wow he's actually saying that the economy um, is part of and dependent on global ecosystems, but in my interpretation he went on to say that. Therefore, the solution is to internalize 
nature into the economy, which is a non sequitur in my view. But that was just for the kind. So I see a bunch of hands, um, and again, I'll uh, uh, I'll say um, uh, on my screen, Bengi is on my uh, left, so I'll go Bengi, then Luison, then Karina. Um, um. I just want to kind of just just want make one point. I don't want to maybe like start a very long fight about whether or not um, ecosystems service valuation is feeding into um, capitalist structures or, but I think it is important what Bob has said. One of the things that he said was to to kind of to to make a distinction between valuation versus commodification, and I think it is important. But I think um, even if evaluation exercise does not automatically lead to commodification, uh, I think putting and framing ecosystem services and commons within a market context, which uh, one thing that Lisi has said, and I try to kind of highlight, was that the economic systems provides the context to which that kind of shapes our relationship to Earth. So I think framing ecosystem services as commodities, as something, potentially commodities as potentially can be valued monetarily changes our relationship and our values and our subjectivities in relation to the environment. And I think, and, and there's a lot of work that kind of shows that that change cannot easily be reversed. So I think we should be opposing this kind of market-based, money-based relation approach framing to the environment. And I think once we make it normalized, as ecological economists, it's very, very hard to go back. I'll just actually make one little comment on that as well, is that, you know, as an economist, when I learned about public services, it were things that specifically should not be commoditized or could not be commoditized and therefore needed to be handled by the public for the society or the community in question. And perhaps a way to look at ecosystem services is things that should not or could not be commoditized and serve the biotic community as a whole, um, just as public services serve the human community. But with that, I'll um, go on to Luison. I'm sorry if I pronounce your name wrong. Probably, I'm sure I do. But. Don't worry, you pronounce it uh, perfectly, perfectly well. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I will uh, be, I will uh, walk a bit in the steps of uh, of Bengi, but uh, I, I remember as a young student uh, getting acquainted with ecological economics, uh, and I had the, the chance to work on the uh, eco uh, environmental services uh, payment for environmental services uh, schemes and so on. I was always uh, uncomfortable with this notion because. I I, um, I totally uh, understand and uh, I, I hear the, the explanation by, by Bob, but then I, I would also ask another question. If monetary valuation does not feed in uh, the capitalist logic, then why doing it? What's the point then of monetary valuation? Because if things are being monetary valued, it's because it's needed to talk to a decision maker and policy maker who are ideologically uh, adhering to capitalism and who have also most of the time social uh, interests because they are at the top of the income and wealth distribution. So uh, it does feed in capitalist structure because otherwise there would not, not be a point in doing it and it would not probably not have been so successful either. Uh, and I think uh, it's uh, those concepts, they are very ambiguous, you know, uh, and uh, I'm not saying they are not useful, but uh, personally, I, I prefer to use them in a more reflexive manner. The same with the concept of natural capital, for instance. Personally, I would not use it as a way to represent nature or the environment in uh, economic reasoning. Also, because I think, from, I, I think from a purely economic theory point of view, it's quite quite weak. Uh, if anyone knows about the Cambridge capital controversies, for instance, uh, but I think the concept of natural capital is very interesting to understand how capitalism treats nature, because it does treat nature as a form of capital, as what Polanyi would call a fictitious commodity. That is something that is not produced by the market, but is treated as such. So we need this concept in a reflexive manner. But I would not embrace it as an analytical tool as such to present nature, and I would even less embrace it as a policy tool, because I think it's too dangerous. Elke, did you have something to? Yes, thank you very much. I'd like to pick up on this conversation too, because 
from what I heard you say in your statement, uh, I've had a lot of uh, what elements in ecological economics uh, need to be strengthened, that we need stronger alliances, that we need more bridges to have the solution. Uh, and the question for me that comes up that was also part of our guiding questions is what should be left behind? What from our understanding of the history of the development of our field, and I'm saying this because we, should, we are especially in a round here where some of us have written critiques on ecological economics, or uh, it's identifying elements that we see as hindering to constructive radical alternatives and transformation. So I'd like to pick up on this now that the debate is going in this direction and ask you all what elements should we leave behind? And do we leave Karina to respond to maybe give Karina the first go since she had her hand up for the other question as well? Okay, yeah, I was actually raising my hand still for the other question, but I will then um, link over to Elke's question also. So what I wanted to say pretty much um, went into the same direction of what Bengi said, so I also think we should think about more about pluralist values, about non-monetary values, and Bengi made the case for um, ecosystem services, and I wanted to stress again, like in, in my input before, I was talking about the similar structural devaluation of um, unpaid care work and nature, and I think the logics in a capitalist system are the same as well, trying to monetize it, to grant um, social recognition on the basis of monetization. And I think like, at least from a degrowth mm -hmm. perspective, I think that's um, in a way very problematic because it once again um, widens the realm of money and accumulation driven social relations, like on the side of care work, for example, if you're monetizing care work, obviously it's not always a commodification. It can also be just, monetizing it for the sake of including it in national accounting, but at the same time, it still widens this realm of money and accumulation driven social relations that reinforces the centrality of GDP and ultimately in a way upholds like this whole status quo of something being value, valorized but not valued. So I think that this is something that um, we should I don't know if we should leave it behind completely, but we should at least critically reflect upon like the implications of monetization, because I, I totally agree with Bob that obviously a monetization is not the same thing as a commodification, but many times still like if like you have this whole um, incommensurability debate, especially in ecological economics, and once you manage to monetize something like it can also be a first step to commodification if you don't have like the right regulatory framework. So I'm also very skeptical any other response to Oki's? Yeah. Please. I don't know how to use my hand here. No. That little hand. I'm not sure. This why. works too. <laughs> this works too. Okay. Um, I don't know whether we can leave uh, concepts like natural capital and ecosystem services behind. I mean, they're so firmly ingrained in the conversation. Um, and people have, uh, and, I, and I think they were uh, productive to the conversation of uh, uh, creating an awareness about the connection of the economy to the earth. So I think they've been uh, uh, um, yeah, essential to that conversation and important to that conversation. Um, but the conversation needs to move beyond that. Uh, to understand more clearly, I think, are uh, uh, the alienation from the earth and the duality. And I'm not sure those concepts are particularly uh, insightful for moving us in that direction. Um, the mo probably the most important thing uh, we need to do right now is to uh, understand the, the need for limits. Um, and I don't know how management of our uh, ecosystem services feeds into that. Um, I mean, I think we have to have very clear understanding of the limits to human expansion. And, um, and that needs to be more clearly articulated. And I'm not sure natural capital ecosystem services monetizing them uh, carries that conversation far enough. But we aren't gonna leave those uh, uh, concepts behind because 
everybody's using those concepts, not just ecological economists, but all kinds of people who are involved in thinking about the uh, earth and the economy are using those concepts. They're here to stay. So I don't, I don't know, that's, that's all I have to say about it at this point. Um, I, I kind of agree with Lucy on the, on, on the fact that we cannot probably leave concepts behind, but not necessarily for the same reasons, probably. But I mean, I would like personally for, for ecological economics to be a lot more radical and, and engage with, with radical political economy a lot more deeply. But I don't, I would still not say, hey, these concepts or these approaches should be left behind. I think the field should be open. I, I don't think there's that kind of harmonious future where certain concepts are, are going to be left behind and then like finally it's going to be a radical field. I don't believe that. I think there has to be uh, some concepts that, that are controversial or that people do not agree with that, that will kind of drive uh, the discussion. So, but I think there, there's maybe a different kind of way of relating to economics and, and kind of intellectual thinking and policy making that I think is prevalent in ecological economics that I think should be left behind that. Um, I agree with, with Ruizon that uh, ecological economics need to kind of uh, aim to be mainstream in economics or, or inform or commonsensical at least, but I don't think it's a matter of just publishing. I think it's a matter of struggle. I think I mean, uh, I think many of us have been either trained in heterodox economics or are uh, familiar with its history. Feminist economics became accepted in kind of economics discipline, not because feminist economists have written the right thing or have produced the accurate knowledge. It's because of feminist struggles. It's because of struggles outside of academia that pushed it into the agenda of, of economics. So I think if there's going to be change, it's not going to come um, because ecological economics will get it right or have predicted everything right or have been building models that are kind of the most close resemblance of what's going to happen. I think and it will come to the extent that ecological economics can speak to social movements and, and struggles around uh, these issues. Um, so I think, and I want to tie it to the fact that, I mean, I think there is kind of a celebration, an uncritical celebration of, of pluralism in ecological economics, and Clive Spash has written on this. Uh, but I want to kind of maybe trace one reason for it to become more relevant to policymakers, to become more relevant to decision makers, that ecological economics have been toning down some of its uh, uh, fundamental ideas. And I don't think it's going to work. I think every heterodox school has experienced this. The more you try to mimic mainstream, the weaker you get. So I don't think um, for ecological economics to become more relevant and commonsensical, the right way is to become more like mainstream or to be able to speak to them. I think there's something else that will determine the success of the field in that sense. Beatriz? Yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, uh, I guess I'm going the same direction as Ben, uh, saying that uh, yeah, I'm uh, I defend the methodological pluralism for ecological economics, and at the same time, I think that after 30 years, we have advanced uh, in the criticism of certain not concepts, but I think that mainly some assumptions uh, behind neoclassical economics, and by saying that, I'm saying about uh, assumptions that uh, were developed in the late 19th century and that even some mainstream economists are not uh, using it anymore. I mean, uh, I'm talking about methodolog methodological individualism, the assumptions about uh, the behavior of uh, humans and uh, also uh, the criticism uh, uh, about the production process the, uh, of the unlimited substitution of factors of production, this kind of uh, criticism uh, uh, of new classical assumptions, I think uh, we have strong positions to, I mean, to move forward because we are answer to real concrete problems and uh, environmental and social problems. And I think that's our, object of study that uh, 
make us you know leave or keep certain assumptions by saying that i'm not saying that we should you know not dialogue with mainstream economics and mainstream economics is changing always and it can change it also answer real problems so benju said about uh, you know the crisis of 2008 and how in the mainstream economics changed a little bit maybe not enough and how is changing now and in face of you know increasing crisis uh, climate uh, change and social problems uh, hope for the mainstream you change you know incorporate some of ecological economics concerns and i think that that is important because uh, the mainstream has you no know, great influence uh, in policies economic policies and macroeconomic policies that's all Luison? Yes, very quickly. Uh, yeah, two, three, three things. First of all, I, I, I agree with uh, what uh, Benji said. Uh, I, I'm not naive on how ecological economics should become the mainstream. I didn't say like the mainstream. It should become the mainstream. You know, mainstream can be anything. <laughs> it doesn't have to be uh, the current uh, neoclassical uh, economics uh, thing. So it could be something else and it could be ecological economics. And I agree that the, the historical context plays a huge role, just like it did for the advent of the domination of neoclassical uh, um, economics. But uh, the current ecological crisis won't necessarily play in favor of ecological economics. It could also play in favor of environmental economics. That is just like a neoclassical micro applied to environmental issues, for instance. So that would not necessarily be a good thing, although there are sometimes some overlap with ecological economics. And uh, regarding the leaving behind discussion, Personally, I, I don't think we should leave behind concept because, for instance, um, we've been criticizing a bit the concept of um, ecosystem services monetary valuation of all natural capital. But again, at least as I understand the thing, uh, it depends on how we use those concepts. For instance, if we want to uh, if we want to understand how nature is treated in capitalism, then the concept of natural capital is useful because it is treated as a form of capital. You know, so leaving behind this concept would uh, deprive us from a useful uh, concept if we use it in a reflexive manner uh, on the way uh, capitalism uh, designed its relation to nature, so to say. Uh, and on the finally, on the on the pluralism uh, discussion, um, I, I totally agree uh, with uh, Bob Costanza when uh, Bob you said that uh, ecological economics should remain a multidisciplinary field, uh, and I think that's different than from being pluralist. Multidisciplinary means uh, trying to bring together uh, different disciplines to produce a common synthesis of knowledge, which I think is a condition of progress in science uh, to synthesize between different disciplines. But this is really hard to do. Uh, and uh, often it is done in very superficial manner, you know, uh, but to do it really uh, in depth, it means integrating the methods of the different disciplines. And that is really hard, but I think that is really an objective we should have. But that's different than, from, than pluralism, because pluralism in research, like, what is it? Like to accept different economic theories? I think that's really good. But each one of us, when we do our research, we are not pluralist. We made our scientific choices. We made our theoretical choices. So we have our frameworks, you know? And if there is at least one quality of pluralism in ecological economics, even if there are some legitimate criticism, criticism uh, against it as well, and I, I kind of agree with the criticism of Clive Spash, for instance, at least it means that in ecological economics, we still have theoretical and epistemological discussions, which never happened in the mainstream, for instance. The discussion you have sometimes in the mainstream is uh, which uh, econometrics uh, technique to use, but you don't talk about whether you should use econometrics to tackle this uh, research question, for instance. And I use econometrics, you know, so I think it's a useful tool. But you understand the you, you understand the difference, you know. So I think the emphasis should be much more on multidisciplinarity than on pluralism. But pluralism, since it's, it does not necessarily need to be a problem, it can also be something good if it triggers theoretical and epistemological debates. Can I just say one more word about natural capital? Um, uh, as I say, I don't think it's something we're gonna leave behind, but I think it is especially problematic in this sense. Capital is not a thing in economic thinking. 
Uh, Robert Heilborn says it's not a material thing, but a process that uses material things as moments in its continuously dynamic existence. Okay, and I think that's important to remember. So when we develop a concept, this concept of natural capital and act like it's a thing, we have removed that from understanding that there is this dynamic process of profit making, capital accumulation, and it doesn't actually care where it makes money. Okay, it doesn't care. So the, you remove that kind of understanding of the process at work when you impose on uh, 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 the natural world, this term natural capital and make it a thing in this economic system, it is not a thing. And maybe it should be. We should look at it as something of integrity but the way that it's used in an economic system is not that way. And so I think that's a particularly problematic terminology. All right, so I'll really quickly, as a preface to the next question, just say one thing that's always puzzled me or something we should perhaps leave behind, nothing to me strikes me as more absurd than putting a monetary value on food. I mean, saying that, you know, agriculture is less than 2% of global GDP, so no harm done if we have climate change is the most absurd statement I've ever heard from an economist. And strangely, I, I think that gets uh, too little attention. Um, but anyway, on to the next question. Um, and there's a lot of very good questions. I'm going to miss out a lot of them. But one that's come up persistently is, you know, why is it so common to treat ecological economics as a subdiscipline of economics when that's obviously not what it is? Um, I don't, let me get back. I get um, any who, takers who on that one? Who does that? Um, so <laughs> then, so that is the question: is who? Who does that? I'm not, I mean, the, the listings in the, you know, the economic journals do, but, um, but so, you know, maybe so that uh, could be a point. Luzon, did you have your hand up to respond to that? Or did you have, yeah. Uh, but just sorry, before I think of Bob, uh, you wanted to say something about. Uh, did, did you want to say more on that, Bob? Yeah. The, the, the previous, I mean, it was perhaps about the previous discussion or. Oh, <clears throat> just back to, uh, natural capital not being a thing, I think it is a thing. That's, that's the whole point that, uh, you know, capital is a stock, uh, you know, that, <clears throat> that can produce a flow of, of benefits. I think that's, that's the way I've, uh, <clears throat> or we've defined it, actually, Herman Daly and I in a paper back in you know, 1992. Uh, <clears throat> and I think that's Herman's definition of, of capital. Capital is just a stock. And stocks interact, produce flows of, <clears throat> of, of uh, goods and services and, 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 and other things. So from a systems dynamics point of view, we're just talking about stocks and flows. Um, <clears throat> and you know, the, the stock of, as, of, of nature, of everything outside the human, human sphere is just as much a stock, it's just as much a thing as you know, the, the, the buildings and infrastructure and people inside the, uh, <clears throat> the human part of the system. So, um, I'm not sure I understand what you were talking about, um, Lucy, but uh, in my, well, I'm in my... talking about, I, th I think it's the difference between understanding a system in material terms and understanding a system in economic terms. The dynamic process of capital accumulation is an economic process. And yes, it does use things, but it is not simply, uh, it's not simply a material system. Okay, it's a system of ownership, a system of uh, extraction of profits, of exploitation, extraction of surplus value, if you want to put it in Marxian terms. It's a complicated economic system that I don't think is adequately captured in its material dimensions. Um, yeah. And I, I, yes, I guess I... that's what I <laughs> And I think that's part of the issue that, that the material dimensions underlie all uh, the rest of the system. And sometimes I don't, I think disagree, the, I don't disagree with you. And I think that's, that's you, one of the premises, I think, of ecological economics is first of all, you have to understand the thermodynamics, the underlying you know, biophysical um, <clears throat> dynamics of the system. How does, how does our life support system actually function? Uh, <clears throat> and I think economics often sort of abstracts away from that 
uh, like you say, and and you know sort of pretends that that uh, that nature doesn't really exist or is not really important. Right, but that is how the system functions. The system <laughs> functions as if those material dimensions are in some sense irrelevant. I don't disagree with you. It's a material system. But I think, it, I think you have to look at it as, as two things. It is both a material system, but it is also a system that functions as if it isn't connected from, as if it's disconnected from the material uh, 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 world. I, I think- isn't that, isn't, that the, isn't that what we need to um, get beyond? Absolutely. I mean, we're in absolute agreement about that. And, but, I okay. agree with you. Good. Yeah. Let's At this point, I want to then. turn it over to Luisan, which will unfortunately be the last um, response to questions, even though there's a lot of great questions out there, but we only have uh, 10 minutes left. So if Luisan wants to give his comment, and then we'll give people their final take-home message. Yeah, the, well, the, the, this discussion actually provides a nice transition to reply to the, the question that was why is ecological economics treated as a sub-discipline of economics? Because I think the discussion between Bob and Lizzie shows how much uh, ecological economics needs to engage more with other ecological, uh, with other political economy approach. Because the definition of capital in political economy is a dynamic definition. It is value in motion. Capital is value in motion. So it's an abstract thing and it can take the form of natural capital. It can take the form of financial capital or manufactured capital or human capital, whatever, because capitalist transforms any, everything into capital. So this is one where we have to merge the understanding coming more from ecology and system dynamics and coming from political economy. And if we manage to do this merging, then we will have very relevant things, I think. So why is uh, ecological economics treated, uh, treated as a subfield? Because there is different schools of thought in economics. Economics is not a homogeneous or unified corpus of knowledge. It is a very heterogeneous uh, body of different traditions who have their, uh, their own, which have their own theoretical, epistemological way of looking at economic phenomena. Uh, so uh, economics is not neoclassical economics, and very often mainstream economists confuse both they, when they mean when they say economics they mean neoclassical economics but they don't even think it's different and sometimes it's not because they don't want to talk about the rest it's just because they don't know that there is something else and that is absolutely a huge problem that we have to tackle as well as ecological economists is that it is normal now if you do a bachelor and a master in economics not to even know sometimes that there is something else just like if you do uh, if you study i don't know if you study sociology you have your master in sociology, but you've heard only about uh, Durkheim and never about Bourdieu. You know, uh, in, eco in economics, that's the norm. So obviously, when you suddenly uh, hear about something else like that, you will conceptualize it as a subfield, as, as a very small thing, because it, it, it sounds very, very exotic. So there is a lot of work to be done uh, here as well in terms of knowledge popularization uh, from an ecological economics perspective and in terms of teaching ecological uh, economics. And um, I guess because Elki's sound is pretty bad, I'll just do this last little uh, request for people to, um, so it's, it's time to have your, you know, take home message for the audience about the future of ecological economics in your last, you know, minute, what would each of you have to say? And I guess we'll go in the same alphabetical order again. So turn it over to Bengi first. I'll start, yes. Uh, I want to kind of take what Liz has said and, and turn it into maybe a take home message about how it's hard to change uh, the economic system. But I think um, I want to kind of counter that uh, friend, uh, amicably with a quote from Gramsci, um, pessimism of the intellect and, and optimism of the will. I think um, part of what the system does in, in, in addition to contextualizing our relationship to Earth is uh, colonizes our imaginary in a different way and, and it kind of makes us unable to imagine change. And I think there's a lot to learn from studying change, how systems change, not, a, not only in scholarly circles, but also from movements. So I think there's a lot to learn uh, for ecological economics from other um, traditions of heterodox economics, but also from struggles and movements all around the world. Thank you. And I guess, so I'm uh, Luisan. Yeah, very briefly, uh, I agree with what Benji said. And I would say uh, it's, 
ecological economics now should try to take advantage of the historical context. I think as tragic as it is now, the historical context has never been uh, as favorable as it is now for ecological economics to spread. So that's what we have to do now. And Bob? Um, <clears throat> I think we need to think of the current situation as an addiction. You know, we're addicted to the current uh, growth at all costs economic paradigm. And the reason that things haven't changed uh, more quickly is that we've been confronting that addiction, you know, with uh, in, in in sort of a <clears throat> a way that doesn't is not the, the proper therapy, really, for overcoming addiction. And we've been doing some work, you know, trying to learn from what works at the individual scale to overcome addiction. And <clears throat> that is not confronting addicts with the problem; it's getting them to think about uh, <clears throat> their their life goals. You know, what what sort of world, what sort of life do they want for themselves? Uh, so I think our challenge is, is just that at the societal scale. How do we create um, a shared vision of the kind of world that we all want together that's going to require you know, a deliberative democracy? It's going to require some new approaches uh, to how do we create that shared vision? And I think that's, that's the way to overcome uh, this addiction is to say we, we have, there is a better way. There is a, you know, a more sustainable and desirable future, <clears throat> but we haven't painted that picture. Um, and, and simply uh, criticizing uh, you know, the, what's, what's out there now uh, is not gonna help us overcome that, that addiction, even though those, those criticisms are, are perfectly valid in both, case, in both cases. Uh, they, they don't lead to, or they don't help to make the transition. So we're talking about understanding how to, how to make these transitions. I think that's an important consideration that we need to, to think about. It's not enough to simply say, things are wrong and things could be better. Uh, it's, it's understanding the, the, the therapy that's required uh, to, to sort of overcome the, the addiction. Karina? Okay, so a brief take home message. Um, as noted before, like so this uh, multidimensional crisis I've been talking about a lot, like it's really rooted in a very specific civilizational patterns. It's anthropocentric, it's monocultural, so it's growth oriented and patriarchal. And I think this also shapes a lot um, the way in which we're framing our problems and in which we're seeking our solutions. It's often like technocratic, it's top down or Western science based. And I think ecological economists have um, in ways resisted to this for a long time. And I think they should um, in the future align with all kinds of transformative scholarships such as e-growth, eco-feminisms, post-development, just to name a few. And also the social movement, as Bengi has also emphasized, that really tried to disrupt the civilizational pattern. And I want to end with a quote that um, Eric Recha, I'm sorry if, you're, if I'm pronouncing your surname um, incorrectly, he wrote in the chat that Bell Hooks wrote um, that everybody, uh, that's a dream of replacing the culture of domination with the world of participatory economics grounded in communal Nellism and social democracy, we can argue about those concepts, but without discrimination based on race or gender, where recognition of mutuality and interdependency would be the dominant ethos, a global ecological vision of how the planet can survive and how everyone can have access to peace and well being. And um, Eric says, I feel that this is the best statement of what the goals of EE ecological economics should be. And I think um, that's a good statement to end um, the panel with today. Let's ask ourselves, like, how can we connect those struggles for non-domination, for climate and environmental justice to link more to struggles against patriarchy, racism, or class relations? And how can we develop a feminist ecological economics that's truly intersectional in this way? Thank you. And Lucy? Um, I guess I will conclude by saying I'm not as pessimistic as I seem. Um, but I think that it pays to look into what I call the black hole of darkness and size it up for what it is. And so I think it pays to pay attention to the, the power of the economic system at hand and to think clearly uh, and focus on um, what levers of change we actually have uh, and to think imaginatively about them. Um, I also think it pays to focus 
And so I hope that the focus uh, uh, continues to be uh, the quest for limits, because I think without the notion of limits uh, in our front and center, in terms of what we do, uh, we will not be able to do what we think we're going to be able to do. Um, we need to step back from hubris. Uh, and we need to think about how we construct an economic system where we take our place as one of the many species that occupy the planet. And I realize that might seem kind of idealistic, but I, I believe that that is uh, uh, in some sense uh, what we need to do if we wanna uh, really think about halting the sixth mass extinction. I don't know what we'll be left with if that uh, continues to its conclusion and it will uh, continue if it goes on like it is now. There's no question about that. And Beatrice, we'll give you the final word. Thanks to your last name. Okay, thank you. Uh, it was very nice to hear all the colleagues and their different views and perspectives and the final debate between these and Bob about cap natural capital. I guess I don't have a strong final message to conclude, despite I'm the last one, but uh, I'd like to say that I think our field has evolved in the last three decades mainly by responding to concrete problems and crucial social and environmental issues. And I think that in the future, we should keep it this critical and reflective thinking. So I think that's the way and you know. So yeah, that's all. And I would like to thank you very much. And Elke and I would certainly like to thank all of you. I thought it was, I wish we could, uh, the nice thing about an in-person conference, it'd be great to continue this over a few beers for a couple more hours, but um, uh, we really appreciate it. And, um, and uh, you've given people a lot to think about. And um, and Elke, I'm so sorry your sound system didn't work well. But, but, and thanks to the audience as well. Tons of great questions we didn't have a chance to get to. Um, so uh, anyway, um, so take care. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.